Well, hello, Quilty Peeps. Welcome back to my sewing room. And happy September, everyone. And you know what September means here in the sewing room is next week on the 18th, on Monday, we are kicking off the hometown sew along. And we'll be making this quilt right here using my hometown fabric. And today I'm going to, I'm you know filming a few days ahead and so that I can be prepared. And I'm gonna show you how to make block one, which is this right here. Okay, this is the flag house. Trying to get it all in the screen. Of course, you know, you've, you've seen pictures of it on Instagram. I've shot it on my previous videos, but I just kind of want you to see what it looks like here. And we are not going in order of of they are in the quilt, meaning this is not, you know, like week one, week two, week three. I just pick some houses um, randomly. I usually pick like the week one that I'm going to do a video on so I can show you, you know, several things in there or things that I want to show you. So I don't know. I just decided to start with the flag house. And in the sew along guide here is the schedule. So, you know, right here which block we're doing. The sew along takes place on my blog. Okay, so within this video description, there's always a link to my blog. So you need to go there every Monday and Friday. I'm gonna be doing one house every Monday and Friday, starting on Monday, September 18th, okay? And, but I always do a video the very first week just so that I can show you hands-on certain things, you know, about each block and kind of talk about them and give little tips and hints and things like that. And then um, on my blog, I'll show you like the measurements, um, what the block looks like. Cass, you wanna hand me this 14 and a half inch ruler right there? My daughter Cassie's here filming me as per usual. So on my blog, I'll be showing you things like my block laid out, you know, special things for tracing, things like that. And then my block laid out, I'll be showing you a picture of this so that you can see, you know, how it lines up and things like that. And that really is the best, the best way that you can measure because you can see all the lines on, on this. And so I'll just be giving you little tips and things like that on certain things that we have to know for each house, um, you know, if they're different, I'll just be telling you the shapes, even though everything's in the guide, like it tells you in the fabric cutting here, like for instance here, it tells you everything, you know, to cut, so, um, and what block it goes in. So for instance, this is, here, let's find a fabric that's in. Okay, so here's the roof pieces right here. So we're gonna go down and we're gonna look at, just so that I can find the flag house. Where does it say flag house? Right here. Okay, it says cut two, three by eight and a half rectangles and use Q9 for the roof and flag house. Okay, and that's that. So then you always know. So when I'm cutting out of the guide, when I'm cutting my kits, what I do is I grab a design board for each block. So I have 12 design boards that I start out on. You don't have to use design boards. You can use bags, whatever you, you know, baggies, whatever you want to do and label them. But I always use design boards. And then I label the design board by putting one of my sticky notes here. And, you know, it says flag house. And so they're all labeled. And then when I go to cut everything, each piece of fabric, so I cut all of this fabric and it tells me where that piece goes to. So if it goes to the flag house, I put it on the flag house board. If it goes to the tea house, I put it on there. If it goes to the sheep house, I put it on there. You know, you get it, that's how I do it. By the time I have got through, I start from the beginning and by the time I have, you know, gotten through every piece of fabric, then everything is cut. And of course I get to my backgrounds you know, my backgrounds right here. I do them all at the same time, meaning I cut them all the same, press them, and, you know, so forth, things like that. Um, when it gets to the interfacing, I don't usually trace anything until I'm actually ready for the block. 
but it does tell you how many of each interfacing to cut if you'd like. And so I just have those interfacings cut and I usually just have the fabric cut ready to go, then cut the pieces of interfacing and just make sure that I have a piece of fabric that matches. I mean, a piece of interfacing the same size as the piece of fabric and I'll just throw it on the board here. And then when it comes time, I'll grab my shapes and go ahead and start tracing. So I wanted to just show you how I trace. And one little thing about this one right here. Okay, about this piece right here, sorry. All right, so when I trace, I just simply take, okay, Cass, can you see what I'm doing if I'm down Scoot here? Scoot up just a little bit. Okay, let me move this up a little bit. Okay, how's that? That's fine. Okay, so when I trace, I simply just take the shape and I have it right side up, meaning I can tell that it's right side up, even though you can see through it, I can tell it's right side up because all the wording is correct and not going backwards. And then I just put it in the middle of the shape. I take a pencil. I like to use a mechanical pencil and my mechanical pencil should be coming out pretty soon, so I'm happy about that. But I like to do that and just trace around it once or twice just to make sure that you can see it. Okay, and that's simply all I do. And then I just match that up to what it sews to. And then I can put this back in my little baggie right here. This one isn't open, but I just wanted to show you this is what we're using is the hometown set of the So Simple Shapes. And so I can just put that back in my baggie. And you know, this leaf, there's two leaves. This one's already traced with the Q27. And so, you know, that's just how I do it. You can do it however you want to. Sometimes we have to trace things in reverse. And what I mean by reverse is, okay, there isn't anything in here that we have to trace in reverse, but look, what if this is a shape that could be traced in reversed reverse if you wanted this to go this way. All you do simply to trace it in reverse, it doesn't change the shape of the, the size of the fabric, doesn't change the size of the interfacing. You simply just take your piece and put it upside down. I don't have this piece in front of me, but you just put it upside down with the lettering going down and trace it. And that means it's going to be going the other way. And that's what I mean in re by reverse. Sometimes we need certain things to face another way. And I always tell you that in my blog during that tutorial for that block, okay? If there's anything special that needs to happen with the tracing. Now, I wanted to show you these pieces right here. Let me put this background out for a minute so you can see what I'm doing because these are a little bit larger. So I've got this piece right here, and this is the Q3, and I just go ahead and trace that just, you know, like normal. What these are, this is the front of the house right here, okay? And then this is the side addition to the house and they're both out of the same fabric. But I'm using the same shape for both of these pieces. And so let me explain that. So this one is just straightforward. I just trace all the way around it and I'm gonna sew just like normal. This one is the side piece for the addition to the house. And see this line right here? What I did with that is I just traced it like that. So what I did was I just started on this line, traced all the way around to that point, and then you can just simply turn it around and use this line for the bottom to line up and then go ahead and trace across, okay? And so sometimes the shape, you can use it in a few different ways besides just doing it reverse. All right, so I've got all these pieces ready to go over to the sewing machine. Just wanted to talk about tracing a little bit, how I cut the kits. That doesn't mean you have to cut them that way. That's just how I typically do it and how I organize it. All right, let's set that over there for me, sis, thanks. And let's talk about the background real quick. So each piece of background right here is cut 16 inches wide by 14 inches tall. And then these are cut three and a half by the grass pieces by 16 inches wide. And so all I do with that is I just sew the grass 
and with a quarter inch seam allowance and then I press the seams open because anytime I'm going to be appliquing on top of pieced fabric I like to press my seams open so that it remains flat and then um, for this block I, I'll tell you whether you need to press in half or if it doesn't really matter on each block but for this block it does help to press in half you can see that the house itself the center of this house is going to line up with that center line and so I went ahead and pressed that in half and so that's what I do to prepare to that point all right the cast will you <laughs> set that over there for a minute and then um, I put my guide over here I'll leave that there for a minute and so what I have to show you now is I wanted to talk about pressing pressing with the bias tape makers okay and so these are called bias tape makers because they're typically for bias meaning when you cut on the bias the fabric on the bias and so that it can kind of curve and stretch around you know, around projects and things like that. I use these just to get the width that I need, but I only press, I only cut my strips on the bias if they actually need to curve a lot. And so let's, I'm gonna demonstrate again. I know I've done this before, but it's been a while. So I'm gonna show you how I have these pieces prepared for this house, okay? So let me move that out of the way, pull in little ironing board here and I dump these out oh and by the way I did I did um, add this edit to my blog post but I left this 3 8 in, inch bias out of my be prepared post I don't know why for some reason I just didn't put it in the picture and said these are the only you know uh, show the picture of the only ones that we needed to use but we are using the 3 8 inch it does look a little bit different than the other makers and it's still by clover and it's purple and it's curved but it still works the same just so you know in case you're confused by that when you're looking at the 3 8 and so let's see I pulled in a few sizes and a few things to show you so this is just a regular 5 8 inch for, that we use for like the stems and things like that for most of the blocks in this quilt. And this is one that we've cut one and seven eighths, I believe. It tells you the widths. Yeah, this is one and seven eighths inches wide because we're gonna use this for the porch, for some of the porches. And so there's that one. So I pulled that in, that goes with that one. This goes with the five eighths inch wide, goes with the quarter inch one. And then I brought this one in. This is 5 eighths inches wide too. And this is this I actually cut on the bias and you can kind of tell by the stretch. Because what this is, is the handle right here. Okay, I know this is a tiny picture, but this is the handle for the teacup right here. So this one I did cut on the bias. There's a few other pieces in here that are curved like this one's on the curve, but I'm not gonna cut that on the bias because it's a very slight curve and I can just press it, a curve into it, and I'll demonstrate that, even though it's cut straight. Um, there's that one and the strawberry one. Now these little ones right here, uh, when I get to that point, I'll see if I need to cut those on a curve or not, and then I'll let you know. But, um, you know, you can decide which you'd like to do, but everything else is just straight that I can tell here at a glance, yes, so it's just this, this these strawberries and this flower right here up in the beehive house and then this is extremely curved so you definitely need to cut that on the bias and so what i do typically when i am doing um my bias i'm just going to show you the curve first i've got my iron here of course i've got my vintage iron and i like to cut if it's not already cut a point in one end and then I just go ahead and spray it down. And I have my spray bottle with a mixture of half Mary Ellen's Best Press and half water. That's how I starch all of my fabric. I do not pre-wash my fabric, but I do starch it at the point when I'm cutting it out, okay? 
and right before I cut it out, I spray it down and press it because I don't like to cut wrinkle fabric. And so now I've just pressed this so that it's dry. And now I'm just going to put that point, kind of thread that through there. And it helps by having the point. You can take a pair of scissors and just kind of thread it through there so that, until you can pull that. Okay. So now that's kind of a start there. I like to have mine with the colored side down so that I can see the top of my fold. I don't want to see the bottom of my fold. And I just start pressing. Now I'm going to get about to this point and I'm going to start pressing a curve. And so it helps to have this little bit of starch and water on there to keep that curve shape. And I just kind of move it around. You don't have to press it the exact curve like like a really strong curve if you don't want to. It just helps to have it curvy at all. So you don't have to follow a pattern and get the exact curve. You just have to press it into a curve like this and as you go along. Also, a good tip is do not touch the iron to this because it's metal. I hope you can see what I'm doing and I'm not covering up everything. But I just go to that point and just press it very curvy and then I let it cool before I move it. And it, you know, you could go like this and make it flat if you wanted to. You could put a clapper on top of it to cool it down. But now I know that once that's cool, that's gonna be nice and curved and that's gonna work for my teacup. Okay, so that when I glue baste it down on the block, that's gonna work. And so still using this one right here and using this size right here, I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut a really pointy point into that. And it's kind of nice to start with the selvage edge right there because it kind of helps start it. And I'm just, you know, I don't have to do this whole long strip at one time. I'm just going to cut, I'm gonna talk about the flower that I told you about the beehive house or you know, the stem for that. So I'm just gonna cut that off just for this purpose so I can show you how I prep that. And again, spray it. And then I press the end to dry that. Get that nice and dry. And I'm just gonna do it the exact same way as I normally would um, doing straight. Okay, you can just go across straight and just keep going like this and that's how I do and I do it slow so I make sure this iron even though it's very hot which is why I like to use vintage irons I go slow so that it saturates that water and starch mixture but because I want this one curved a little bit on the end I'm gonna go ahead and just start doing a little curve going this way. And so see, even though this is not, let me move that out of the way, even though this is not cut on the bias, because it's such a slight curve that I need, I'm not gonna have a problem with curving that. See, that's nice, that's gonna lay, lie flat. And this is why I like to have the top up, because sometimes you can end up pressing a fold in there and all you have to do is, is uh, you know, you can see that when you have the top. Otherwise, if it's on the bottom, you wouldn't see that and be able to fix it at that point because you don't want to respray it again because then that would undo the whole thing. Okay, so that's how I do that one. And then I'm gonna just, even though I just said don't move it until it cools down, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a chance on that one because I want to show you how to do this one for the front porches. So nine houses have this front porch and then the other three use a so simple shape. And it's kind of like a half round front porch. So I do it the same way. I just do that pointy point. Press the end there so I can get a nice start. And when it's wide, I don't think I've ever showed you how I do the real wide one. It's all, they're all the, the exact same way, but you know, it's wider. So sometimes um, 
you may wonder how how I use that but what I do is I hope you can see that I just make sure that this is curved up around the side evenly and then once again I definitely press it from the front because I don't want any creases in this one so I want to see what's going on and I will just simply pull it out like this a little at a time I've got my fabric on top of my fingers here and like my pinky finger and my ring finger and I'm just going across here and then you can stop here if you want to and make sure it's coming across straight I'm almost I'm almost running off I'm almost running off my board here so let me pull it up here that was a good catch I almost could have melted my mat <laughs> okay so now I'm going across right here Sorry for that noise if I startled you. Okay, so then I just leave it like that to cool. And then for each porch, again, I'll tell you in each one, but just so you know, I cut these five inches long. And then I will press those ends under uh, at the time when it's time for the block so that it's three inches long and I've got those raw edges pressed under. And so that's what it is for the porches. Okay, so that's my little explanation on the bias. And now I'm going to take these pieces over to the machine and we're going to sew a few of the shapes. And I'm going to show you how I sew them and how I shape them. So I'll be right back. Okay, here I am with Miss Dolly. I'm going to turn off her light so that there isn't a strange glare. And um, I've got my shapes here. And I'm going to show you how to sew like one of these leaves. I'm going to show you one each of anything that just isn't rectangle or square. Okay. Meaning uh, this one has inner curves. So I'm going to sew that one so I can show you how to do this one. This one has cleavage areas. This is like an oval circle. This is an outer curves. And I'll just sew one of these so I can show you that and this one. And the rest you know, I'll just do on my own. They're all the same. And just so that you can kind of see how I shape all of those things and how I trim them, I'm just going to go ahead. It's easier if I put them on a, on a design board to move them around. Okay, so on my machine, what I do is I set for a small stitch. I'm like, on my featherweight, I don't know if you have a featherweight and are using it, but it's about a 20 or maybe a little shorter than a 20. But So I can't really tell you exactly how big it is if you don't have a featherweight, but um, I'll show you. They're just, they're just smaller stitches. I found that it's just easier to just do small stitches in the first place. And let me pull that off. So what I do when I start sewing is I'll just go ahead and... So right into the line and then I use an open toed foot of some kind so that I can see exactly where my needle goes in and I don't did you notice that I did not back stitch I'll show you how I end and that's how, just how I start I just start sewing and then I just pivot when there's a corner and I just continue on sewing right on the line I'm gonna put a pair of readers on so I can make sure I can see what I'm doing I try to keep my face out of the camera so that you can see what's going on here with what I'm doing so that you can have a close-up look of my work. But sometimes that means it's harder for me to sew because I usually like to get up pretty close and see what's going on. I want to make sure I'm not sewing crooked. And then... You know, I just continue pivoting. Now, if you have a tiny piece that's very, um, kind of has fussy curves or something like that, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if I would call this a tiny piece that has a lot of curves or maybe this one, but you could sew around it twice if you wanted to, just to strengthen it so that if you're worried that you're going to poke, poke out some seams, you know, as, as you're turning, you know, when you're shaping it. Okay, so now I'm coming up right here on where I started. And the reason I started here is because I just like to over sew 
right on top of where I've sewn, and then I can sew right off and go to the next shape. But Cass, can you get up close to that so they can see how big those stitches are? I don't know. Let's see, they're pretty small. All right, and then I just pick up my next one, and I don't pin um, unless it's a large piece, but you could. But I don't typically pin because this interfacing, you know, kind of sticks a little bit. It's kind of hard to move around. You know, it doesn't slide off, I guess I should say. I shouldn't say it's hard to move around. Um, and so I just leave it like that. This is the one where I'm worried I'm going to not sew on this flower piece. This shape also doubles as a shrub but on some of the houses. But this one is the top of the flower in the flag house. So, especially when you're sewing curves is when you want to make sure that you do have an open-toed foot and that you can get in there close enough to see where you're sewing. So I'm just going to do it the best I can with this one. And if I found that I've sewn off the lines too much, I'll just hurry and re-sew it off camera. <laughs> but, you know, it's just the curve of a flower. It doesn't have to be perfect. These trace lines, if you sew exactly on the trace line, your shape will be exactly the same as the So Simple shape. But if you're off just a little teeny bit, like this one, see I came up a little bit on that curve because I couldn't really see what I was doing because I couldn't get up in there because I wanted you to be able to see it. But I think that's going to be okay. It's just going to be a little bit higher curve. It's just a flower shape. You know, it's not going to matter. So, you know, what I like to say is, you know, it's good enough for who it's for. You just have to kind of pick your battles on what you want to fix and what you don't want to fix. And if you feel like you've made a mistake before you think, oh, I have to do that whole darn thing over again, before you recut and retrace and do all of that stuff, really look at it on your block and say, you know, is this going to be okay? Is this part going to be tucked underneath another piece? Does it really matter? You know, what's the look that I'm going for? And, you know, that's what I, that's what I do. And so I'm just kind of giving you that advice. And then on this little oval for the flower center, I'm just over sewing a little bit and then sewing right off. And again, I'll pick this one up. And then I'm just going to start into here because I know it's going to be easy to over sew on that seam and just run right off the seam easily. And so usually when I'm doing leaves and flowers, yes, I do sew on the line, obviously, as much as possible. But like I say, they're kind of a little bit free form and it might not matter if you're a little bit off of the actual shape. When you're doing the house, you probably want to make sure you sew right on the line on that because, you know, you want everything to line up and measure correctly. But I don't know. That's just kind of my advice on that. If you cannot see um, your pencil line, you can always use like a fine, kind of darker, maybe a very fine, thin marker. But I don't know if I would use a Sharpie because then that goes too thick. I would probably use a Pigma pen that has black ink and it won't um, like smear or bleed on your interfacing. So maybe you could try that if you have a hard time with that. Now normally I do sew with my light on so I can see a little bit better, you know, when I'm sewing. Um, but I just have my light on off for this again, like I say, because it's a strange kind of glare. Sometimes depending on what I'm sewing. And I'm going to start this and then trim those, clip those away. And, you know, it just saves thread by just not stopping and starting and trimming threads. I just go ahead and run them all through, you know, clothes lining, just like I do when I do my patchwork. Now the last piece I'm going to sew is just this cute little moon that goes over the house. I hope you guys are all getting some time to sew and I 
hope that you're looking forward to this so long as much as I am. I absolutely love doing house blocks and I love doing applique and so simple shapes. And I hope you're excited to build this neighborhood with me, my hometown neighborhood. Okay, so after I've got them all sewn, the next thing I do is I just go ahead and trim by approximate quarter inch seam allowance. Sometimes I'll use a smaller seam allowance if it's a smaller piece. But what I do with the points is I'll go ahead and trim a little bit closer to those points. But I don't want to trim really close because I don't want to cut into it. Plus I use the seam allowance. You know, I use the bulk of that seam allowance when I'm shaping and I'll show you what I'm talking about when I do this moon. Okay, I kind of, I kind of sewn off of that shape a little bit. So I'm just gonna start where I started sewing off and try again on that line. I guess I shouldn't worry too much if you see my hair or my face or something leaning to the camera. <laughs> I just want you to be able to see what I'm doing is all. Okay, so when I trim that, this is an inner curve. So if I don't clip to where I've sewn, it's not going to lie flat when I turn it. So what I do is I just take a nice sharp pair of scissors right here. And this is a curve, but it's not a real super duper deep curve. So you don't have to clip real close together. But you do have to, tr to clip to the threads, not into the threads, but to the threads. So you want to do that. You know, you want to be able to get up close and personal with that. I always have my readers on when I'm doing this so that I can see those threads exactly. And so just put on whatever strength you need to of the readers if you need some so that you can see. And that's what it should look like. See, like that. And then how I turn it is I take my seam ripper and I will just go into, not my fabric, but just into the interfacing right there. And I can fill with my finger, you know, if I'm going to go in and I'll just start like one little tear right there or a cut, whatever you want to call it. And for this, just a little curve and then open it up a little bit more like that. And then I just stick my thumb in there and I just turn it. So I, I wanna turn this one on camera because I wanna show you these points. So let me grab my turner over here. And what I, what I meant by the seam allowance, so I always like to have my inner facing towards me when I'm shaping. I'm just going to take this and I'm going to, I'm just pushing that seam allowance up there. And when I say pushing, I am pushing, but I'm doing it very gently. And I turn when I need to, and I'm just pushing on the seam allowance. I'm not pushing into the interfacing or the single layer of fabric in the front. I'm trying to push that seam allowance up there. See? Now, when I get it up to that point right there, that looks pretty, pretty good. But I do like to do it sideways like this. And once again, push on that seam allowance. And that point comes out very nicely like that. And then, you know, for these inners like this, I just try to shape it so that I can see where the thread meets that fabric. So that I know that that's going to be the exact shape you know, that I did that, that I sewed it. Sorry, I got sidetracked. <laughs> and again, I'll just turn this sideways right here. And then for the outer, I'll just very gently push these. And I know you can't tell on camera how, how hard I'm pushing. When I say push, I am pushing, but very, very gently. Okay, so... I'll press that in a minute. I want to show you how I do. I like to trim with my larger scissors. And this one I might trim a little bit smaller. This is the flower that I said I went off of the curves when I was sewing just a little bit, but that's not going to bother me at all. It's not enough that it's going to even make a difference. Okay, and then these are cleavage areas, not an inner curve, but every cleavage area you're just going to clip one clip 
right to that cleavage area. Now, even if you've got your readers on and by accident you clipped in to the thread and you can see that you did before you turn it, just, I, I did not, but just in case I did, and I can see that, and you can see that if you go like this and your thread, you know, is not together, then just go ahead and re-sew it again before you turn it, okay? And so again, I'm gonna do this little turning right here, making sure that I'm only in the interfacing. Now you can, this is a good, a good time to tell you this. A lot of people have said, you know, you could do a little cut right in the interfacing before you sew so that you don't have to do it at this point. But of course you can do that. And I've done that before, but I prefer not to because I like how the piece, this interfacing is all one piece without any cut in it and how it adds stability for when I'm going on the curves and sewing, I don't want to pull it apart and distort my seam and how I'm sewing. So I just prefer to do this in the end. But of course, you know, there's always more than one way to do things. There's no, you know, right or wrong way, really, as long as it ends up in the same, you know, way that you want to do. I simply just show you how I like to do it. You know, and that's the best I can do is just show you my tutorial on how I do my shapes, but that doesn't mean you have to do them exactly the same way I do. Now, when I turn it, it's not going to look exactly, you know, perfect, but that's okay. That's where this point-to-point -point turner comes in. And I just start pushing out a little bit. And on those outer curves, this is exactly how I do a circle. I just do it gently, and I'm turning like this. I'm holding the piece in between these two fingers, I'm pushing on the interfacing, I'm, excuse me, I'm pushing on the fabric only, not the interfacing. So the seam allowances in front, all of those three layers of seam allowance except the fabric is the only thing that's on this back layer. And that's why I like to have it facing away from me so that I can take this and just kind of work it. Cotton has a little bit of a give to it and so you can stretch that just a little bit until you get that to the shape that you think you might want to, you know, just press it. So I'm just putting these over to the ironing board right here. And I'm just gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna um, do this on camera, but I'll probably just have some music in the background because I don't think you need to hear me saying the same things over and over again. This is the exact same way that I do every shape. And then we'll go over and press.
Okay, so now I've put all these pieces over here. This is where I need to take my readers off so I can see what I'm doing. And I like to use my my iron and my seam, my seam roller and my clappers for this. And usually what I'll do at this point is I can either do this on the back side or the front, but I usually just kind of quick press that. And the reason I do that is because that sets the seams there because literally when I when I iron, I don't iron. I like to press when I use the iron. So I want those seams already all the way out to their edges. And then I'll just put the clapper on. So that's especially things like this that have an inner or an outer curve. I want to make sure that I just at least roll this over. And so that I can just press on top. This one looked pretty good. I don't think I need to roll that. And then I just simply put these clappers over so that it cools faster. Let's move down to this end a little bit. This one right here, anytime there's kind of a cleavage area, most of the time I'll use this roller and just go like this back and forth. And it really kind of helps any creases that might have been occurring there. Okay, and then I can just press them both at the same time. And yes, I do have a lot of clappers, but I do sew a lot of seams at the same time and a lot of locks, and so <laughs> I do that. And so then I just let them cool off like that. And that's how they look. Okay, and I like to make sure that there's no folds under here, that it looks nice and flat on the back so that it's not gonna make it you know any taller than it needs to be i do like the dimension with this interfacing left in i really enjoy that i like how the block looks with that i do not trim anything out from the back i leave it just how it is and so those those pieces are ready to sew and then i've got all the other pieces that i'm going to sew off camera and i've got my background all ready and so we're going to go over to the work table in just a minute as soon as I finish sewing and shaping all of these pieces. So I'll meet you back there in a few. Okay, it's been a bit, so I'm back. And so I started building this house. We're gonna make it look like this, okay? So I just thought I would save time to just kind of show you how I go about setting this up. And it's kind of almost like building a real house. I just do a lot of measuring. So the first thing I did was I went ahead and went in a half inch. Okay, so there's a half inch hangover of this roof here. And I went up a little less than a half an inch. But basically, you want this just a little over seven and a quarter inches tall. Okay, so I went ahead and glued that right there. So that it ends up being about seven and a quarter inches. I mean, it's not gonna matter either way. See, as long as there's room here, you just don't want it any taller than a seven and a quarter. You know, that's my best guesstimate, I guess, on that. And then, you know, we just need half of the roof. Instead of tucking this whole thing under here, I'm just gonna go ahead and cut it. I just didn't wanna cut it until I had it glued on You know, and then that we can just save that for another roof maybe that goes this side, <laughs> which isn't in this quilt, so. But anyway, so I've got that piece, all right? Then I glued one of these taller rectangle windows up two and a half inches, okay, from the bottom, two and a half inches, and glued that there. So now I've got the, this piece ready, all right? And then I'm just gonna lay these down here. And then I'm gonna explain the house itself because that's what I'm gonna do with all of the blocks is just kind of build the house a little bit before we add it to the background. And then we get all that right. And you know, it's a lot of pieces, but it's okay if we just break it down to one element at a time. And so the things that I could glue together 
beforehand, I did. And as long as you just know how tall it needs to be, you know, and I put the center onto the flower, except I'm looking at that now. And I think, okay, so this is a good lesson about why I love Sue glue. See, I can take that off. See, I think it needs to be centered over here more. There's more on this side showing than this side. So what I'm gonna do is simply just rip that off and re, re glue it and center it a little bit better. Okay, that looks a little bit better to me. And you know, it's like sticking up above by, you know, half inch, maybe a little bit less than a half inch. But that's all that needs to look like. I also just glued the blue field onto the flag right there, the field of the stars. Okay, now let's talk about the house. Okay, so for the house, what I did was first, I was just worried about the height of the house. I put the roof on first, okay? And so it is about 10 inches tall. It maybe is like 10 and an eighth inches, but it's just under 10 and a quarter, 10 to 10 and a quarter, okay? So I glued that on. And then I put the chimneys on and I know I wanted them one inches high. So I put them on one inch high and a half inch inside each side. Okay, so that's what I did first. And then I went ahead and did these windows two and a half inches up first. I did that first and just like a quarter of an inch in. And then I just put this simply on the bottom in the center. Okay, after, because it just lays across the bottom and I know that it goes two inches on each side. So you can make sure that you have it centered by measuring two inches on each side. Okay. And once the door was on there, I just centered that. It all lines up at the bottom, so that was easy. And this point is gonna go across the point of the center here, and that's gonna be fine. So once these were up two and a half inches, then I measured just under half inch and put these windows up. If I go more than a half inch, then when I go to glue this on, it might go into the windows too long. So that's why I brought them down a little bit. So they're a little less than a half inch, okay? And then I glued this on just making sure that it looked, you know, kind of even going across that. Now I didn't put the addition on yet, but I could have, but I just wanted to show you how I did that. And then all you have to do with that is just, you know, make sure it lines up at the bottom. And then we're just gonna find out how much we wanna tuck. We want it to be two and a half inches, which is just like that. So, so we'll go ahead and do that on the background. But those are the things that I did first, okay? And so, because I did all of that, and I know that this needs to line up in the center, and I, and I also want this house to go down over the grass by a half inch, so I'm always bringing my rulers in to, you know, so I just put that on any line right there. And so I know that I want this to go down to the three and a half right there because this is on the three. So I put this there, so I know that that's a half inch down and then these longer rulers come in handy because you can put that on the center seam right there. I can see my fold from where I pressed and my fold from where I pressed there, so I know this is straight. So I just wanna make sure that my house is straight. Now I can see that it is not because I'm looking at this line right here and this line right here, see how it sticks out wider? So I'm gonna bring this over a little bit and then try again. And to me, that looks straight and centered. And then, um, yeah, that looks pretty good. You know, and you know, there's no such thing as perfection. So you just wanna get it as good as you can get it. And so you don't look like you have a totally crooked house, but you know, even that's okay if that happens. And then what I do is I am just going to stick a few pins in 
in the middle here so I can still lift up and tuck things under if needed. And so before I glue, I pin everything down. And so I know that this is gonna go even at the bottom, meaning that's gonna be a half inch up there into the grass. And I want this to measure two and a half inches. So that's exactly where I want that. So I'm just gonna stick a few pins. In fact, I'll bring that pin up here more. So, okay, so that, that looks good there. And then I think I'll do the flower last because it just goes in between the flagpole and the flag. So this flagpole, you want it to measure, you're gonna press both ends under and you want it to measure 11 and 3 quarters inches tall, this flagpole, okay? And then you're going to have it come into the fabric, into the grass fabric, by about a quarter of an inch. Let me measure what I did over here on this block. It looks like from the flagpole to the house on the inside measurement there is 2 and 3 quarters. So I'm going to Grab that, measure two and three quarters. And so that's where I know I need to put my flagpole. And I'm gonna stick a pin in there to keep it in there. And then I'm gonna use this ruler to help me keep straight. Make sure that I, you know, pin my flagpole straight or I glue it straight. So how I'm gonna do that is make sure that this is straight on this line right here and the side of my house is straight right here going on this line. Okay, and then I'm gonna move it over so that it's on the two and three quarter line and keep it at that. So here's the two and three quarter line and that's how I know this is where I'm going to glue that, just like that. So what I'm gonna do is take my glue and I like to just put a very thin strip. I don't want my ruler to move. I'm just kind of dragging it along here so that it's not gonna put a ton of glue, but it's gonna be enough. I'm not sure how high I go, but I can always add a little bit more if I need to. And then I'm just gonna go ahead. So rulers really are your friend when you're laying out this block because it's not really a freeform block. You kind of want to make sure everything lands within this, um, the 14 and a half trim it ruler. But I kind of already did that because I made this block, so I kind of did it for you. So I'm just telling you those measurements. But um, on my blog, I'll just show you, you know, kind of build the house as I can, pre-build pieces just like I did with this one, pre-build the pieces and then, um, you know, tell you the info that you need to know. But that final measurement with all of the pieces underneath is really what's going to help you the most. Okay, so I have that down there. And then I know that the flag itself is going to come down about a quarter of an inch. You know, you can eyeball it. It doesn't need to be an exact quarter of an inch maybe a little bit less. And it just goes right there on the edge. I just wanted to put that flag there because I wanted to put another little dot of glue right there. So I can stick that pin in. I wanna make sure it's straight though before I do that. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and stick a pin here. And now I can lift this up. And just glue that down. And since that's glued, I'm gonna go ahead and put the pins in on the corners. I'm just gonna let that dry. I'm gonna take this pin out, move it up a little bit so that I can glue all the way down to the bottom on this since the pin was holding its place, so I didn't do that yet. Okay, 
So now before I add anything else, I'm gonna go ahead and glue these pieces down. And this is all I do is just do a little dot. A dot is a lot, and it's just a dot in place of where you would maybe want to pin. Okay, so that's in there. And by the way, look, I got my sea glass little uh, flower power pin holder in it, just barely came into the warehouse. So I was excited to use that. And so all I have to do, all of this, you know, the window's already glued on, so I'm just doing the edges and kind of pulling it out. When I say pulling it out, like pulling out the pieces to make sure it, you know, is straight and nice so that it will stay down there. And then I'm gonna pull this up and make sure I have glue there all the way to the corner. Because honestly, I couldn't remember if I did the top or not. <laughs> So I had to check that. Okay, so now that's glued. And then I'm just gonna pull up this roof right here. Since nothing needs to tuck underneath it, I'm gonna go ahead and glue it down and see where this sticks out, these little chimney parts. I'm gonna put a little dot of glue there. Probably a dot there, a dot there. And then down to the corner there. Okay. And then I just like to put them all the way, these pins all the way to the corner. You know, and I don't really stick these pins all the way through. I just, you can all the way through the design board if you want, but I just stick them into probably about halfway into the design board so it will stay that way. I can take those pins out because this is gonna hold this into place and I'm just gonna fold this whole thing up right here. And when I'm gluing, notice I don't do it all the way to the edge. I like to come in a little bit, um, maybe a little bit more than a quarter inch, but you know, about a quarter inch because if you're hand appliqueing, you can go through the glue, but it's easier not to. And so I don't find it necessary to glue all the way to the edge. I wanna be able to leave that very edge free so that you can get your needle into there, whether you're machine appliqueing or hand appliqueing. The glue is water soluble and you know you can remove it like I showed you, but so it's not super duper stiff, but it's still nicer to not have to needle through it. Okay. So since my windows are already on there and everything like that, I don't have to worry about that. I just have to pin around the edges. So now this is all pinned. Put one there. And now I'm gonna go ahead and do the flower and the front porch. In fact, let me move these pins up just a little bit because the front porch is just gonna go centered, you know, kind of like where, where, um, about a quarter of an inch up and then centered on the door frame. So I might just put that in there and go ahead and lift that up. Put some glue there. Put a couple of pins down here. So that, now that's holding them into place. So now I can lift this corner up a little bit. And sometimes if you know it's going right over that edge, you can just put a little bit of glue on that edge because that's kind of bulky there. I'm gonna put several pins just to make sure that it stays in there. Okay. So that's, okay, to me that looks like it's going up just a little too much. Now, when you go to trim this, just FYI, on all of this grass is gonna be the same. Let me remove this pin so I can show you what I'm talking about. When you go to trim this up, let me just pull this ruler in. Your grass is always going to be on the line of the two inch mark right here. So then you're gonna trim trim it after you're finished appliquing so that this line, the top of the grass is always on the two inch line. 
and that means you're, you're cutting it two and a quarter inches because this is a quarter inches and by the time you sew it into the quilt, that means each grass strip is gonna measure two inches tall. I hope that made sense. And it's that way with every block. Um, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what I did with every block. You know, if it's different, I'll tell you in that blocks tutorial if that changes, but I can't imagine that it will. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the roof pieces last. Let's go ahead and do this. This is gonna go just kind of in the center and what you're gonna do is see where that little indent is at the bottom of the vase where it starts. You're just gonna bring it down a little bit. So this, the bottom of this is actually not going to be even with the bottom of the house. And it's not going to be even with this either. It's gonna be kind of in between. And then you're just gonna look at the top here and see that it's kind of centered, not exactly centered, but it's okay, you know, between these two, if you want it exactly centered, just move it over until it is. It's pretty simple to do that, okay? And I'm gonna stick a pin here, move these down, stick those there because I want to put the stem under there before I glue it down. And all I do with that is I know it's gonna come out the middle, so I just start in the middle and I let it tuck under there by about a half inch on the center of that. And I can go ahead and pin that right there. And then I can continue doing this. I just really go along and use my pins to hold everything into place once I've decided where exactly I want it to be. And then before, you know, I just kind of measure twice and glue once. <laughs> and then I can go ahead and put these in here. Then I can fold this back. And if I wanted to, I can just put a little bit right here instead of on the background. I can just put a little bit of glue and just make sure it's going straight. And this is pretty easy to eyeball because I have two straight lines on each side, and then I can just stick a pin right there. And then I know, I, I believe it's three inches. Let me measure real quick this one. Yeah, okay, so I wanna measure exactly, let me move that pin so I can put this ruler down so you can see it. I wanna measure exactly three inches from the top of the flower, okay, and to, and when I say the top of the flower, I really mean the bottom of the flower. This cleavage area right here, I want that right at the three inch mark. Okay, so I'm just gonna stick a pin in there. I know that's the height that I want. And then I'm just gonna make sure it's kind of centered on both sides. And go ahead and put a dot on each petal. That's really all you need. And then just a few here. And then I can just put one pin into each petal. And since that's already glued on there, I don't need to glue that. Um, I mean, I don't really need to pin that, but I do need to glue that right here because I want it to go to the background a little bit more. So maybe I will put one pin in there just to make sure it kind of goes down into that background. Okay, and then I've got my two leaves left. Here's my other one. This one goes on the bottom and it actually touches the bottom. So you can kind of go like that and just center that center of the leaf right there. And I'm gonna move that pin up there. Put a few glue dots. And then the next one, you really don't need to measure. You can just kind of put a few dots on it right here. And just put it up to where you think it looks, looks good, where the spacing looks good. So I really enjoy having these shapes already turned and pressed and not have to worry about the seam allowance. The seam allowance is already taken care of. And this way you can really lay out your blocks and see exactly where you need things. 
Now the moon, before I do that roof last, let me look at this other one and see what it's doing. The end of this moon looks like, the side of this moon looks like it's about even with this. And it looks like, let's see, it's almost three quarters of an inch above that and kind of turned that way. So I'm just gonna lay my ruler there. And this is, again, a kind of an approximate thing. You just wanna make sure it doesn't go past past this line when you um, for when you're trimming it up and you can kind of turn it in however you think it looks good I actually think mine needs to come in just a little bit more like that and then because it's pinned I can go ahead and lift and put a few dots of glue. You really don't need, need a lot of dots. So while I'm pinning this, I just wanna say, make sure that um, you read the description and then uh, click on the see more or whatever, or the little arrow, whatever it is on whatever device you're looking at so you can see the full description of this video. So you can see the links to my blog, the links to how I applique, you know, the links to the be prepared. So speaking of that, since you are, if you are just tuning in and just now hearing about this so along, the end of last month, I did do a be prepared post and that tells you all about the so along and I will link right directly to that on my blog post. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is do this. So these are turned under, okay? And so this entire thing, let me tell you, this is an important part. This needs to measure three inches after it's turned under, okay? So you have a three inch long thing. Now what you're gonna do here is just put some glue right here on the edge of this roof. I'm not gonna go all the way to the end yet because I want to tuck this one under. But I know Got a little straggly there. So sometimes if you have little extra threads there, I just cut them off like that at this point. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this over. This has a longer little piece. So this is gonna kind of tuck under a little bit. Let me use the shorter one. I left the point not quite um, glued under the point of this so that I could pull it up and tuck that under. Okay, so that's just barely going over and it comes down and it almost reaches that right there, that window. So I'm basically overlapping by about an eighth of an inch. There's a little bit of glue there seeping out, so I just kind of wipe that off. Now I've got this piece that's turned under, but it's raw edge under here because it's gonna tuck under the other thing. So it measures two and three quarters after this is one end, okay, it's tucked under. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just put a little line of glue here. And I'm gonna tuck that under there. And make it so that this almost meets the window as well. And I need to lift this up just so I can see that that's, yeah, that's straight. And then I'm gonna put a pin there, lift this up, put a little dot of glue there, pin it, put a little dot of glue here on this end because I didn't do that yet because I wanted to have the freedom to be able to move it up and down if needed. So now this, needed just a little bit of glue at the top right there and now I can go ahead and put glue all the way to that tip there and this fold is going to tuck under and around that raw edge. This is a little <laughs> little difficult because I'm doing this farther away than I normally would do it very close up. I think this needs to be folded under just a little bit more 
meaning it would be just a touch under three inches. So all you have to do is put some glue there and I just bend it under a little bit more just so that that point looks nice. Okay, I'm gonna stick that in there. Okay, I'm gonna make sure that I've glued everything I did. And then at this point, I already know that these measurements are going to work out because I already, you know, did this block once. And so that's how I know to show you, but I'm gonna go ahead and take these pins out. I'll take these out last just to give them that extra time to dry. So usually when I'm taking pins out, I'll take out the ones that I put in first <laughs> because I know it really doesn't take that long for it to dry. I mean, this moon's not gonna go anywhere. And I wanna put the ruler over here because I still have time after I put the ruler over to check it and make sure that everything's gonna stay within the boundaries that I need it to stay in for the finished block. If you leave your pins in too long, it's harder to get them out. So I like to take them out, you know, right when it's dry. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna take these out. I don't think they're going anywhere at this point. Shame on me, I forgot to put my lid on. Okay, now I'm gonna bring the 14 and a half inch trim it ruler in. And this is what I'm talking about with the two inch mark right here, okay? I can see that if I lay this ruler on here, that everything is gonna be within these boundaries, okay? Because what this is, is a quarter and an inch. This is 14 inches in between, and this is a quarter of an inch, which represents the quarter of an inch that's going to be sewn into your seam allowance when you sew these blocks together. So I think this looks really good. At this point, if you feel like something is crooked or you want to move something, you can. You simply, you saw me pull something up before you saw me pull that up. You can just simply pull it up and adjust it and do what you need to at this point. But at this point, even if it's not perfect, it's good enough. Like I'm looking at this line, it looks great. This is a straight line, that's a straight line, that's pretty straight. You know, it's straight enough. The flagpole's straight. Everything looks good to me. And so that's how I use that ruler, you know, back and forth. Usually if this was the first time doing this block, I would have been pulling this ruler in back and forth each time to make sure, like, you know, my width here was good to go and everything like that. So that's what that looks like. You let it completely dry. And I like to peel it up too after it's dry just from... The design board to make sure it's not glued to there. And so let's just talk about applique for a second. So at this point, when it's completely dry, I applique and then I put this on here and trim it up after applique. So I do have an applique video where I show you how to machine applique, hand applique, and stuff like that. So I will link to that. And again, that's in the description. And I also link to that in the Be Prepared post as well. But how I tackle this is I'll take my thread and say, okay, I'm gonna do brown thread. So I'll just pull my thread for all of these right here and I'll just do all of the brown. Now, I don't need to, let's see, what don't I need to applique? I don't need to, to applique things that are tucked under. Meaning, for instance, this right here, I would do this entire square in blue. So I would applique this to this red piece. I don't need to back, to go all the way through to the background, I just need to applique. Now, I'm talking by hand right now, because if you do my machine, by machine, it's gonna go all the way through, and that's fine too. But you don't have to with hand applique. As long as this is stitched to the red, then when you go ahead and stitch the whole entire thing, you know, to the background, that's fine. So I just would do this in blue, thread right here, and all of this in blue, everything in blue, like from down here, and down here, and then all the way around here, all the way here, 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 and here in blue. The brown, like I started out with, <laughs> I would do all the way to there, all the way around there, and then all the way around there, and then all the way around this entire thing, 
and all the way around this entire thing. I like to do one color at a time, whether it's by machine or by hand, and then I just move on to the next color. Now, if you're doing it by machine, you only need to change your thread on the top. Um, you can leave your bobbin in off-white down below, and that's what I do. I just quickly change my thread at the top, and that's another reason why it's convenient to do all the same colors at the same time. In fact, that's if you're doing one block at a time. Um, I usually wait until all of these blocks are complete before I do the applique itself. And so I would probably stick my blue thread in there, for instance, say blue, and I would pick up every block and do all of the blue. It really doesn't matter what's first or last or anything like that. I, it just is easier and say, okay, I'm gonna do all the blue on every block. And then now I'm gonna do all the brown on every block. Now I'm gonna do all the green. Of course, you don't have to do this because it's already sewn in. And that's just how I tackle it and how I do it. Um, you can do a straight stitch applique if you want to and just literally top stitch with brown or blue. Or you can do the tiny zigzag. You can't even tell that it's zigzagged, it's so tiny. Um, that I've shown you on my on my tutorial and if you want that down there more and then the hand applique stitch is just a regular applique stitch that you do with needle turn traditional needle turn but you just don't need to use your needle to turn your seam allowance under because it's already turned under and it's just sort of like a whip stitch but again I recommend that you go and look at my um, tutorial for hand and machine applique if you have never done it before and so you simply applique it Press it from the back, okay? Everything needs to be pressed from the back. You don't really wanna start pressing things from the front. I press from the back and then I just put my ruler on and I trim it up and it's ready to go into the quilt. Now, um, I wanted to, before I go, I wanted to mention these blocks right here. So I had already sewn these blocks and this is the first row. There's 10 different patchwork blocks, five inch patchwork blocks in the quilt but you make four of each, one for each row, and then they're just done with different scrappy fabrics from the collection and kind of mixed up the order too in each row, so it's not exactly the same. But I will be doing a tutorial on these blocks as part of my Sew Your Stash series so that you can see how I sew these blocks together. And so I'll be doing those and finish those all throughout this sew along, within the sew along dates from start to end. So um, I'll be doing 10 different tutorials and 10 different videos for each block as, again, my Sew Your Stash series because this is a perfect stash buster um, block and these are, really, these are really fun to sew. And so that takes care of the piece blocks. All of the cutting for the piece blocks is in the Sew Along Guide, and, um, but just not the piecing instructions, but I'll be doing tutorials on that. Okay, I hope I haven't left anything out. And thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super excited, as always, about this sew along, but this is very near and dear to my heart because it's hometown and it's about my hometown. And, um, oh, one more thing. Okay, so you can do a quarter inch button or a half inch button or a three eighths inch button for the doorknob if you want to and stitch that on for every door. You can either do that before your um, quilting is done or after your quilt is done, you can go ahead and stitch it on there afterwards. It just depends on your quilter and you know whether they like, whether, whether they're okay or what kind of quilting they're gonna do if they're okay with the button on there. And okay, so I will see you on Monday on my blog and I'll be talking about um, you know, a lot of things I talked about today, but not everything. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope um, you have a great weekend. I'm going to post this a few days before Monday. This will probably go up on Thursday night or Friday before the sew along starts. Um, please leave me a comment if you have any questions and leave me a comment. If you like this tutorial, please give me a like and um, I appreciate your support of my channel. I appreciate you all subscribing to my channel and um, it really helps me to grow my content and to grow my channel so that I can bring um, more fun things to you. And um, so I hope you all have a quilty kind of day and I'll chat with you later. Mm -hmm.